welcome to this final in the series of um, brief mini lectures as part of the Open Day program at St Francis Theological College here in Brisbane. My name is Greg Jenks. I've been on the faculty from time to time over the last 20 or 30 years. And my role these days is as the director of the Centre for Coins, Culture and Religious History, which is attached to St John's Cathedral in the city. So we're going to be looking at the question of what coins might have been in the money bag or the purse of Judas Iscariot. In other words, what were the coins available to Jesus and his disciples? And we're picking up a theme which we find in a couple of places in the gospel. Here's an example from John chapter 12, which mentions in passing that Judas Iscariot was the person who held the common purse. He looked after the common funds. And already we can see there's nothing positive being said here about Judas. Even this information about his role within the group is, has been, is being used to portray him in dark terms. He doesn't care about the poor. He was a thief. He was responsible for the common purse and he used to steal what was put into it. So that's the characterization that we're getting here um, in the case of Judas. So we need to go back because for us, we're looking at the back to the sense to the origins of coins. Today, coins are coming towards the end of their um, usefulness. We tend to have collections of coins in the ashtray of our car, but we don't use them much for everyday transactions. And so there's a history of coins going back around 2,600 years back to ancient Turkey, what today we would call Turkey or Anatolia in ancient times. So we have some examples there of very ancient coins. Firstly, the electrum, the uh, electrum um, um, parts, uh, pieces, which would show up naturally in the rivers. These were identified as possible tokens for use in commercial activities for buying and selling things. And then the idea developed that these could be marked to make them distinctive, to represent the city where they were being used, Athens, Lydia, you know, Aegina, etc. They could also be marked with, to indicate the ruler. You can see that particularly in the case of the coin from Alexander the Great. And, and they would be, uh, they came to have as the, as the art of engraving and minting coins developed, we go from fairly simple designs to much more elaborate designs, including, of course, um, the inclusion of letters, as well as mint marks, various other pieces of information, which means that in effect, the coin becomes a micro multimedia object, telling us about who's in power, who they're trading with, what religions they're, they're practicing, and so forth. So if we look at the case of um, the province of Yehud, so we, would, we go back to the province of Yehud, which was the name for Judea in the late Persian and early Hellenistic period, we have a number of coins there, which let us see the, the, the earliest developments of coinage in what we would recognize later on as uh, the land of Judea, uh, the southern part of Palestine. These coins are not as sophisticated as those which have been produced by Alexander the Great around the same time, but and so they reflect a more provincial context where the, uh, uh, the, the uh, resources for coin manufacture were not as sophisticated. In terms of Jewish coins, and indeed coins that may have been in the money bag of Judas, we come first of all to the coins of Alexander Janaeus. And you'll notice he reigned for around 30 years and to be, to be the king of anywhere for 30 years, to be the prime minister of anywhere for 30 years, means you're pretty good at politics and you've sustained your position of power and leadership. So this is one of the coins from the Cathedral Coin Selection, coin set number nine in that particular set that's on display at the cathedral. And you can see the design is very simple. It's a bronze coin. It's not very large. Because it's a Jewish coin, it doesn't have any pictures of people. 
but rather they use symbols such as an eight-pointed star or, of course, the anchor. And this, these kinds of coins of Alexander Janaeus stayed in circulation for well over a hundred years. And in fact, when the uh, rescue excavations were done at Mary's Well in Nazareth, just prior to the year 2000 of the Common Era, they actually found a coin of Alexander Janaeus lying in the mud at the bottom of the well. Coins that are of more immediate relevance to the time of Jesus, to the time of Judas and the disciples, brings us down to Herod the Great, who was king of the Jews from 37 through to 4 before the Common Era. Again, just highlighting a couple of features of these coins, and these are, these are all coins that have come from the collection, and the first one at least is in that sample set, which is circulating around the room as I speak. So you'll notice these coins again are small, they're not particularly high quality, they don't have really sophisticated engraving skills, they're not even particularly well struck, they're not always centered in the, within the actual flange of the coin, but as with all the other Jewish coins we'll be looking at, they have no image of the emperor and they have no image of Herod the king. He was a pretty tough guy, but he wasn't going to upset the, sens the um, sensibilities of his Jewish population. So we have poppies, we have cornucopia, um, signs of abundance and plenty. We have anchors, uh, we have helmets, we have any number of things, but we won't find an image of the emperor or indeed of Herod. And that continues more or less for his three sons who succeeded him in various parts of his own prior realm. So when Herod died, most of his, a number of his children had already been murdered along the way, but there were three sons and one daughter who survived him. The daughter got an olive grove, palm olive grove, and an island, and the three boys, competing for the role of king, had their father's kingdom divided up between them. And these are coins issued um, in the decades up to and around the time of Jesus. First one at the top is a coin of Archelaus. He, he got the lion's share of his father's estate. In fact, he just kept using his father's mint, but he did add the letters for Ethnarch, which you might just be able to pick out at the top of the right-hand um, image in that set. He was dismissed after six of the year six of the Common Era, uh, and we'll come to what happened in terms of those coins later. The next brother is Antipas, Herod Antipas, who reigned from the year 4 BC through until the year 39 of the Common Era. And um, his coins are, are beginning to break away from the coins uh, pattern, which is so familiar. He's putting his own, his own stamp on it, as we might say. He's using the symbol of the palm branch He's putting very clear dates on the coin, if you know how to read the inscription. Uh, these are coins that are minted at Tiberius, which was founded by Antipas in honor of his schoolmate, the emperor Tiberius. And so the minted at Tiberius, they have the name Tiberius on them, but of course Tiberius surrounded by a wreath is also a nod to the emperor Tiberius. Antipas, is the one who in Mark's Gospel and Matthew's Gospel is called King Herod outside of the infancy story, whereas in Luke's Gospel he's simply called Herod, sorry, Antipas or the Tetrarch. Luke is playing, paying a bit more attention to the specifics. Antipas would have been delighted to know that Mark and Matthew referred to him as King Herod. That was exactly the job he wanted. So this coin is minted in the year 3031. That's the year of Jesus' crucifixion in Jerusalem. And according to the Gospels, um, Antipas was in town that weekend. Final coin is the coin of Philip the Tetrarch, the last of the Herodian sons. And um, his situation is a little bit different. Firstly, he's the only one to die in the job. 
Uh, he dies in the year 34. He's not removed by the Romans as both Archelaus and Antipas were to be. But the other thing is Philip's territory is much further to the north. Most of his uh, population are not Jewish and therefore he's able to include an image of the emperor on the, on the front side, on the obverse of his coin. And although it's not very clear to make out, this is one which actually came from the Bethsaida excavations it's from the Israel Antiquity Authority's um, collection now. And it shows the bare head of Tiberius looking to the right. And on the other side of the coin, you might just be able to make out the outlines of um, a small temple with um, four columns, uh, presumably reflecting the Augustium um, in the city of Caesarea Philippi. And around the outside, if it were a clearer image, you'd see Philip the Tetrarch, city founder. And this is from the mint at Banias or Caesarea Philippi. Again, it's from the year of Jesus' crucifixion in Jerusalem. So we focus on the Herodian sons, but of course, after the dismissal of Archelaus, you have a series of Roman procurators who um, run the province, this particular area, on behalf of the emperor. The most famous of those is Pontius Pilate, and we used to say that he was there from 26 to 36, but now it's more common to understand that actually he was there from 17 to 36. And that in itself tells us something. This was not a prestigious appointment, but Pilate is there, or if you like, is left there for the best part of 20 years. In any case, his coins are very, very similar to the Herodian coins. They're simple bronze coins. That's because um, gold coins could only be minted in Rome. Silver coins could be minted in a small number of provincial cities who'd been authorized to do that. And no Jewish ruler during the Roman period was ever permitted to mint silver coins. So these are bronze. They're the basic Prutar coin of, of the Herodian period. But what Pilate has done, he's put symbols of the emperor in his role as Pontifex Maximus on the front of the first two coins and on the reverse of the third example. So the emperor is being acknowledged even as a pagan religious officiant, even though his image can't be there. So the, the power of Rome and the sacred power of the emperor is actually being quietly promoted by these coins minted under Pontius Pilate. Of course, there were also other uh, Roman coins that came from provincial mints um, it's very rare to find a gold coin minted in Rome turning up in Israel these days, but silver coins are much more common. And we have three examples there. We have, um, we have two bronze coins at the top, and then we have a beautiful a silver tetradrachm uh, drachma at the bottom. Uh, you can see these are much more finely prepared. The engraving is much better. The minting is more likely to be... Uh, sort of centered on the coin and um, in some cases uh, the coins the axis is reversed from the front to the back of the coin but generally speaking these are very high quality coins and silver ones in particular of course don't rust and they they're not affected by moisture and the soil that they're in so roman provincial coins will would work anywhere in the roman empire whereas the bronze coins of jerusalem were only valid within the Herodian territories. So Jesus and the disciples would have perhaps a couple of these uh, more, if you like, imperial coins, as well as a handful of the other coins, the more local coins. And basically you needed almost 1,000 um, prutot, the little bronze coins, to make up the value of one silver denarius. Finally, there's the temple coins, the coins that were used uh, for the offerings at the temple. And these always came from the mint at Tyre. And the reason for that was not the religious iconography, which as you can see is entirely pagan, 
celebrating the local pagan god at Tyre. Rather, the interest of the priests at the temple in Jerusalem was that unlike most silver coins throughout the Roman Empire, the mint at Tyre did not debase the currency and these were in excess of 90% silver. So notwithstanding the iconography, which was offensive to Jewish religious sensitivities, the temple offerings had to be made using one of these coins and you would pay the appropriate exchange rate in order to trade in a, a bag full of um, bronze coins to get one silver coin, which was acceptable at the temple. So these coins in their, in their various ways, they're providing us, as I said, a kind of multimedia insight into what's, um, what's going on. The, the metal from which the coin is made, the skill with which the engraving is done, the religious titles or the other symbols which might be attributed to the ruler, the uh, relationship between power and religion and population is of course being articulated through these coins and their distribution patterns tell us which towns were trading with each other and, and which, uh, which coins would have been limited just to a, a local market such as was the case with the Herodian coins. So these are the coins that are likely to have been um, in the, the money bag of Jesus, which was held by Judas. If I might just draw your attention to the bottom coin on this slide. Um, this is a silver uh, tetradrachma from Tiberius. Uh, it comes, it's minted in Antioch. We can't be entirely sure of the date, but the interesting thing about this coin is on the front and the back, on the obverse and the reverse, it's celebrating the divine power of the emperor. So on the front, it has Tiberius, Sebastos, Caesar, Kaiser, and on the back, it has God, Sebastos, Caesar. So when Jesus says, perhaps in relation to this coin, whose head is on the coin, of course, it's, 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 it's referring his questioners back to the question of, well, who minted this money? Well, you give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, but make sure you give to God what belongs to God. So let's pause there. We'll take some questions and then uh, we can move on to the next session. Thank you.